Klaus Leisinger is president of the Novartis Foundation for Sustainable Development. He served as special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on the UN Global Compact, which is the world's largest corporate citizenship initiative. In this interview, Professor Leisinger discusses progress and challenges as the Global Compact celebrates its 10th anniversary. The Global Compact has the unique advantage that you look at what is the common denominator of the international community with regard to human rights, with regard to labor standards, ecology, and, go and you go to United Nations declarations or conventions that have been passed through the UN with 120 or 140 countries supporting it, committing to it. Not all of them have uh, kind of of put them through the national parliaments, but nevertheless they have made a commitment. And this, in a way, to me, is that a broad range of stakeholders has said, yes, this matters, and yes, this is the right thing to do. And to me, then, this is gives the legitimacy that this is something that we ought to apply all over the world. We have uh, set standards with regard to the living wage, we have set standards with regard to business and human rights, and in addition, and that is one of the objectives uh, of the Global Compact, and that is to help uh, that the Millennium Development Goals are, are reached, we have uh, a significant access to medicine program, be it up, uh, be it uh, upstream, what Paul Herling is doing, or yeah. be it downstream, what Silvio Gabriel or what our foundation is doing. We have been setting standards with regard to corporate philanthropy. We have been honored as setting standards in that area. More and more NGOs who were extremely critical at the beginning because they said this is a paper tiger. Uh, you cannot enforce it, uh, and uh, this is why it's uh, easy for a company to say that we are complying and nothing happens to them if they are not complying. And they created this uh, word blue washing that you would be using uh, the emblem of the United Nations to kind of give you a good image uh, while you under the table are not a good actor. Uh, that more and more NGOs accept the Global Compact today as, as a standard uh, to be complying with and then come forward with their own interpretations of, for example, what does it mean, uh, you know, human rights, right to health, right uh, to other things. If you talk to people on human rights, they have intuitive associations to things that have to do with torture, have to do with, with political imprisonment, that have to do with the civil and political rights much more than with the economic, social and cultural rights. Mm. There's a right to employment, there's a right to work, there's, there are rights, uh, you know, there are cultural rights uh, much more aspirational than the first, the first part, the civil and political ones. But the pressure was on the rich companies, the profitable companies, to do more and to do better. People who are living in Germany or in Switzerland or in a lot of European countries and now also in the United States have a basic health insurance, meaning that if somebody gets sick, uh, there is some provision that at least primary health care or essential services are, are paid for if the people themselves are not able to pay for it. This is not the case in 90% of the developing world. They are patients, and we have 2.5 billion patients who are working poor, get punished twice once they get sick. They cannot work and they miss their daily income and they have to pay out of pocket whatever they get. We are better off in the sense of uh, uh, we have gone through a very deep reflection process here. The point today is, and that's a little bit my fear, is that a lot of people have the feeling our house is in order. So, you know, 
why should we invest more resources in here? And the answer is because the debate goes on and new issues that were never discussed in the past under Global Compact uh, uh, heading all of, all of a sudden become Global Compact issues. It's obvious that uh, medical trials uh, in developing countries will become a, an issue. Even more so pediatric medical trials. Whose children? What, does, uh, what is informed consent? How much do you pay poor people and still have it voluntary rather than, than you know, kind of lure them into something mm. that they wouldn't do if the price would be so high? Uh, you know, very interesting questions where I simply would recommend let's be part of such a debate early on. Let's even initiate such a debate. We have good intentions in our company, we have good people in our company, we have valid points to bring into the argumentation, and if at the end, you know, our name is part of a process that says these are good practices, uh, that's what I think is leadership in this area.